Well, welcome to the second day of this conference. I have every expectation that today is going to be just as interesting and, as, and informative as yesterday was. And I'm very glad to see so many of you here, despite the fact that it's sort of almost first thing in the morning. Our first speaker is Scott Mandelbrot, who I confidently suspect needs no introduction to you at all. Um, and he will be leaving, kindly leaving time for questions at the end of his talk. And if you would be so kind as to take hold of this mic so that your question can be recorded, um, because we are recording the proceedings, we didn't have anybody in the team who takes sufficiently accurate shorthand notes. So we thought we'd, we'd resort to modern technology and simply record it. Scott, thank you very thank you, much Saskia. indeed. Um, well, I'm going to talk about um, books and libraries uh, in the context of building projects and uh, the development of the chapel. And really, I'm just going to show you some pictures and we'll see where we go from there. Um, I'm hoping, which is why I'm hesitating for a moment, to be cast into Stygian darkness in the vain expectation that this will make it easier for you to see the pictures that I have to show you. Um, although in practice, I think it will simply make it easier for you to go to sleep. Um, but that's fine as well, because it's very early in the morning, and I'm, I'm pleased that you've um, decided to come and share your slumbers with us um, and, and let me send you to sleep. I also hope I'm not going to fall off the stage, which I may do, and that will be very funny. Um, I think the context in which I'd like to set my remarks uh, is a topical one. Um, and it may be that this is because of my own obsessions and the obsessions of people like me um, in the current world. But I think it's topical also for the people we're talking about. And that is I want to set my remarks in the context of a century or more than a century um, of attempts to deal with a grotesque act of national self-harm perpetrated by an unaccountable political elite. And I want to think about that self-harm in the context of the three things that mattered most to the people who I'm going to talk about. Church, university, and the world of learning. That act of self-harm was the Reformation, um, which is traditionally seen uh, in English historiography, possibly correctly, and this is one of the contexts for understanding the actions of the people I'm going to talk about, as uh, a spur for a new form of nationalism, undergirded by new ideas of imperial nationhood, uh, which draw into them concepts of the independence of the church and the redefinition of the church um, as a national entity. And those are all things which are indeed part of the story, the ongoing story of what is going, of what is happening in the Peterhouse, the environment of Cambridge and the Peterhouse environment and the building of the Peterhouse Chapel in the 1630s. One can see elements of all of those things there. One can also see them very strongly in the attitudes of the people who most famously are associated with the destruction of the chapel. But I want to think about a different set of priorities, which I think um, give us a deeper understanding of what people were trying to do. And those are priorities which are shared over a longer period of time, which is why I thought it was worth approaching this from a uh, hundred years of history rather than just a very few years of history. People like Andrew Pern, whose picture is on the screen. And those were pe are people who are interested, as I say, in the restoration of church, university, and the world of learning. A universal church, a universal church in which, as I will say a little bit later, the British church might be held to have a very special place but not necessarily a very special place because of a nationalistic view of Protestant nationhood. 
a university which was to service a universal church and with it a state which was outward looking and participating in a wide range of business, not just the business of nation building. And a world of learning, a world of the production of books, which moved in an international community, an international community still defined by Latin, not by vernacular languages which nobody could speak outside a tiny community of uh, backward people like the English. And those are all things which, as I say, uh, motivate Andrew Pern. And they motivate Pern's successes and also mark his failures. They mark the successes and failures of generations of reformers of the University of Cambridge and indeed of the University of Oxford, two places associated with church, state and the production of learning, which are devastated by the effects of the Reformation, which very nearly ceased to exist in their historical form because of the political decisions of the Reformation, which see their institutions of learning, their libraries, pillaged in the 16th century because of changes in patterns of learning and the production of learning, as well as because of the direct action of royal agents, and which are, for the next hundred years, in looking for ways to restore these things, and ways to restore these things that build in new visions of what a church, university and learning might be. So, Andrew Pern, together with his friend Matthew Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury, are engaged in the re-establishment of the University Library in Cambridge, the building of two new libraries associated with their colleges, the colleges of uh, Peterhouse in Pern's case and Corpus Christi in Matthew Parker's case, um, that bring into the university environment new resources, which in the case of Parker and of Pern at the University Library and Parker at Corpus are drawing in um, the lost uh, intellectual heritage, mainly actually of um, the second wave of institutions dissolved in uh, the context of the English Reformation, not so much the main monastic libraries, but other religious institutions um, that also uh, as university colleges are threatened with, are undermined by this process. And they're also engaged directly in the regulation of books and the printing trade. And here it's worth saying that the English book trade um, is remote. It cannot sustain itself with the printing of Latin, uh, with the printing of... Uh, it cannot sustain itself as a producer of Latin books because the market for Latin books in England is too small. If there is going to be a learned press, an outreaching press in England, it must uh, approach a continental audience of uh, intellectuals. And it has to do, it can do that either within a limited sphere or of, for example, Protestant Europe or within the much broader sphere of the entirety of Europe depending on what it is producing. And the regulation of the press is also part of this movement of change. And on the right hand, um, left, yes, your right, right hand side, you can see Andrew Pern presiding over um, a book burning, um, which um, is a burning, in fact, of Protest Protestant works um, in uh, the centre of Cambridge, um, which, um, oh, there we are, there's Pern, um, which uh, were written by Pern's friends, Martin Bootser and uh, Paul Fargius. So this is an event which is part of the upheavals that I've been talking about, but which pits, put, pits Pern against some of his intellectual friends and allies uh, within um, a more ironic form of Protestantism and um, which also pits the collector against the attitudes of the state in terms of the building of libraries. So that's the long-term history that I want to talk about. Now to move to a more local example and to a modern age and to bring in a context of uh, restoration. Um, 
This is an example of something which is lost, which was uncovered during a process of rebuilding, not exactly of restoration, well, and of restoration. That is, um, the investigations about the extension of the college library that went on in the mid-1920s, and that uncovered behind the panelling, which you'll see shortly, of the um, modern Pern Library, the Pern Library which has existed since the 17th century and which some of you uh, were in yesterday evening, uncovered behind that panelling evidence of the bookcases um, which had been in the original Pern Library constructed in the 1590s, which is the first part of the college's move to building on um, the uh, Trumpington Street side of its original site and to turning um, the land and the businesses which had operated there into um, resources for the building of, uh, of, of the college's functions in religion and learning. That library um, and its fittings, the fittings of the 1590s, were swept away in the period that we're talking about because they were not uh, felt, for various reasons, to be suitable for uh, the purposes of the college in terms of its mission of religion and learning. In particular, um, the library was too small. It was also marred by uh, the shortage of funds which had constructed it in the first place, which had led the, the builders of the library to reuse shelves, in fact, from its med the medieval library that had existed before. Um, so that's a, a one comment about the way in which uh, the library uh, restoration, uh, the library rebuilding of the 17th century, its attitudes to the past. There are also things to think about in our modern attitudes to the past, because obviously when this was rediscovered, uh, nobody thought that the solution was to recreate a library from the 1590s, um, a library that might look a little bit like this one in Trinity Hall, rather than to keep the library that they had. But at the same time, that uh, act of exploration revealed some new finds that told us about the history of the period of reworking of the library, uh, the history of the 1630s in particular. Because behind the panelling which had concealed the uh, remains of the lectern bookcases uh, was also found, uh, concealed, uh, three of the uh, set of uh, Caroline Park books that had been compiled for the use of the music in the college chapel. And they were found by a college servant called George Witt. So I hope we'll involve our uh, college staff very heavily in this process of restoration and change as well. But I want to move now to the 17th century and to think about some of those contexts in religion, universe, church, university, and library building, which represent some of the contexts for the construction of the new work at Peterhouse. And I want to start with the work of Matthew Wren in 1617, um, in order to, to set, again, the intellectual context for the work that is going on at Peterhouse 20 years later, 15 to 20 years later. Um, this is the uh, benefactor's book, which Matthew Wren commissioned for uh, Pembroke College in Cambridge. And the principal reason for that act uh, was uh, to enable Wren to record the gifts to the library of this man, man we've already met, Lancelot Andrews, Wren's patron and also um, the great donor to the library of Pembroke College the man whose patronage stands over that institution and over its transformation in the 16 uh, teens and 20s and 30s into um, a model also for a new kind of divinity, a new kind of divinity which is represented as much <coughs> in the now lost uh, Pembroke Chapel of uh, the pre-Civil pre War uh, Cambridge as it was to be in the new chapel of Peterhouse built then, 
uh, a chapel in Pembroke where uh, Benjamin Laney, uh, the patron, for example, of Richard Crashaw, as well as friend of Matthew Wren, um, established patterns of worship which attracted Puritan ire every bit as much as did uh, the worship in Peterhouse Chapel. We shouldn't see what's happening in Peterhouse as being entirely sui generis, nor should we see the activities of patronage and the activities of um, the development of new kinds of uh, building of collections and building of spaces of worship as being a unique act uh, brought into the university setting uh, by uh, at Peterhouse and not happening in various ways all round both universities uh, in the 1620s and 1630s. Um, and I want to pick that up a little bit further by thinking about another patron um, who is active uh, in this context um, in a minute. Um, and that's the patron uh, of uh, St John's College, uh, for whom Richard Crashaw, uh, trained at Pembroke, moves across the street uh, to Peterhouse in the 1630s, for whom uh, Richard Crashaw uh, painted uh, this picture of Charles I, which is a copy of a portrait of Charles which hung in the Master's Lodge in St John's, the Master being William Beale, who again John Adamson mentioned yesterday. Um, so you've got a, a linkage between lots of people, lots of different uh, heads of house, lots of different people who are interested in the university, in training young men to take new positions, uh, in training them to show skill in new kinds of arts, music as well as painting, um, and in building new collections based on the patronage of powerful figures in the English church who want to reshape that church to look at uh, a world, the, the international world of Christendom in new ways. And that's the context for the Peterhouse Chapel building, for the consecration of the chapel in 1633. Um, and uh, in that context, uh, this is the, uh, one of the texts of the consecration. Um, uh, in that context uh, and the context of the creation of new uh, kinds of learning and worship, I want to just think a little bit also um, about what uh, might be being used in the chapel, and that's the other thing I'm going to talk about today. Um, so what's going on, for example, when you sing psalms as part of what you can see is a, lat a largely Latin consecration, uh, act of consecration, which then moves into, in 1633 at least, an English liturgy of um, and an English act of worship. Are those psalms being sung in English or Latin in 1633? I'm not sure, but I am sure a little bit later, as you'll see. So, This is an account, one of the accounts of payments for the books of the college chap that were to be used in the college chapel. And up here, although you won't be able to read it, um, is uh, a statement about uh, the per a purchase of um, eight Latin service books, two books of common prayer, and two Bibles for the chapel. Now, the eight books, eight, uh, the, the total spend would work out, therefore, with each of those eight service books, costing uh, roughly two shillings uh, and ten pence each. What could they have been? Here we are living in uh, a world, uh, as we were told yesterday, in which at least some people, for example, the people in Exeter College, Oxford, or the people in Emmanuel College, Cambridge, are worshipping in a fully reformed way, uh, without altars, um, without uh, the kinds of uh, service and the structure of service that is implied in the consecration of the Peterhouse Chapel, undoubtedly worshipping in English, saying and not singing psalms, although they may be doing that uh, to uh, using uh, 
uh, Psalter texts, which allow some form of chanting as, and lining out as well. But what else is going on? Why, why can we conceive of Latin in services in 1633? Well, we can conceive of it because of um, one of the moves of the English Reformation already in 1549, uh, Cranmer's first prayer book, but then in, uh, after 1559 in the translation of the, um, the Elizabethan translation of the second uh, Ed, um, of, of the Edwardian prayer book, um, and its presentation in print, uh, and it's, it's probably edited by a man called Walter Haddon, who has very strong Cambridge connections. Um, and it was intended, this book, um, to, be, uh, to allow the continuity of worship in Latin in the universities and in the royal colleges um, of Eton and Winchester. And it was intended to do that because, no, firstly, because the students and the fellows in these environments were supposed to live their lives in Latin. That is the language of learning but also because there was a recognition of um, the importance for that process of the continuity of Latin services uh, and the adaptation of them, or some form of adaptation of them, to uh, the reformed services of the Church of England. Actually, the translation is extremely free, and there are all sorts of problems about regarding this as really a Latin book of common prayer. Um, it's also a complete failure. There is no doubt whatsoever, well, complete failure. It's not an, abs an abject failure, but it isn't really a success. There, are, there is no, uh, no chance whatsoever that this book was being used in Peterhouse in the 1630s. There is also no chance whatsoever that reprints of it, for example, from the 1590s, were being used in Peterhouse. What might Matthew Wren have bought if he was buying books of Latin prayers. Well, really, the only option I can think of, although I think it's still think it's extremely odd, is this book, which is an edition uh, of, uh, again, the Latin prayer book, um, produced at Oxford by the university printer in 1615. Um, here is the anatomist of melancholy's copy, Robert Burton's copy. Now, it's not surprising Robert Burton should have a copy because the book is directly produced for the use of the community of the cathedral, the new post-Reformation cathedral in Oxford, um, that is the community of Christ Church. But it really is produced for Christ Church, so it's very hard to see how it could have been used in the context of any other college. But that is the only option, really, that Wren might have purchased. And I want to come back to, therefore, to a problem a problem in the conception of the new Peterhouse Chapel, the conception of a new kind of worship, a new kind of worship which, as we'll see, is uh, presenting a new form uh, of uh, the interpretation of what the British church might be, but is also looking to make uh, the best of the novelties and the rediscoveries about the ancient church happening in continental particularly in Tridentine Europe. And part of that process is a reinvigoration of Latin worship. And I'm going to, to explain how that is done in the context of the Peterhouse Chapel in the 1630s. Um, and the key, some of the key people and some of the key co the contacts for those people I'll fill in again now. Um, we've already met uh, Christopher Wren, uh, Matthew's brother, um, here dressed uh, in his, uh, in it, for his ceremonial office as um, the um, Dean of uh, St George's Chapel in Windsor, the Garter Chapel. Uh, the statutes of the Order of the Garter on the left-hand side were revised by his brother Matthew. So these, part one of the contexts we need to throw into this is an interest in indeed in English medievalism, in the revival of uh, English orders of chivalry, the revival of uh, an English national past, as I suggested earlier. But it's also more things. And it's also, as I've also suggested, not limited to churchmen of the eventual persuasions of Matthew Wren, Christopher Wren, or John Cousin. Because we should bear in mind that there are 
These trends in religion, learning and printing are trends and, and collection building are trends which transcend the political divisions that really matter in the English church of the early 1630s. Political divisions between the influence of rising stars like uh, William Lord and the influence of uh, declining figures like George Abbott, Archbishop of Canterbury, and John Williams, uh, Bishop of Lincoln. Williams here, as painted by Crashaw, um, was one of the major patrons of both uh, Oxford and Cambridge. On the left-hand side, you can see his construction of a new library in St John's College uh, in the 1620s. His portrait by Crashaw is in the Benefactor's book, begun in 1627 to recognise a major donation uh, by Williams uh, to found this new library, whose patrons are recorded in the window at the back of the room. Uh, the great, great window which looks out over uh, the river. Williams, almost at the same time, uh, end of the 1620s, beginning of the 1630s, and intimate involvement and patronage in the construction of Lincoln College Chapel in Oxford. A chapel decorated with Old and New Testament scenes uh, in its stained glass windows by the same group of Flemish steniers who produced the stained glass window in the east window of Peterhouse Chapel. Now, Williams and Lord, Williams and Wren, will end up in the late 1630s as being political opponents, as being people who, have, who represent almost, at least in the historiography uh, produced after um, the Civil War by Lord's apologist and William's great enemy, Peter Halen, people who represent opposite poles of, for the direction of episcopacy, the direction of the English church. But actually, they have an enormous amount in common in terms of their view of the reworking of these uh, ideals of religion, the university, and collections for learning. And they have a shared vision, in many ways, of um, that future. Oh dear. You can't see this, but this machine is now telling me that it wants to restart, which I hope it isn't going to do. Good, it's now moved on. What sort of future is that going to be? And here I want to bring in some elements of John Cousin. What sorts of ideas for the reform of the church did people have? Well, they had, as many stories tell us, nationalistic ideas, ideas which privilege the history of the Anglo-Saxon church, here seen in the Tomb of Bede in Durham Cathedral, a tomb which uh, John Cousin restored for the visit of Charles I to the cathedral in 1633. And royal entries are an important element in the history also of John Cousin's activities and of the activities of people associated with the reform of Peterhouse in the 1630s and 40s. Those people are interested in fulfilling, for example, the plans of the Duke of Buckingham to remake the University of Cambridge and to make it like Thomas Bodley and others and William Lord are making the University of Oxford at the time. They're inspired by royal patronage, but they're not necessarily prisoners of royal policy. Instead, they have a vision of the Anglo-Saxon church, the primitive church, the church uh, here of not perhaps Adam's, but Lucius's house in paradise the primitive uh, ideal of the English parish church as the kind of meeting place that the first Roman missionaries or Joseph of Arimathea himself might have set up in, uh, Ro in late Roman, late Celtic, early Anglo-Saxon England before the arrival 
of the emissaries of Rome, before the arrival of St. Augustine, before the arrival of papal authority in England. This is a story of the antiquity of the British church and the antiquity of the British church uh, tied up with also a history of the antiquity of a particular form of English church government and English law. This image comes from Henry Spellman's edition of the canon law of the English church produced in the 1630s. Now again, in the 1640s, that project is going to be a deeply divisive one between Puritan and uh, churchmen. But in the 1630s, it's much more complex than that. And uh, in the new library at Peterhouse, uh, the university's professor of Anglo-Saxon, Abraham Wheelock, works using books collected by Andrew Pern on his own edition of the Anglo-Saxon laws published in the early 1640s. And in terms of church building, it's worth bearing in mind also the cathedral context for this. What is special about the English Reformation? One of the things that is special is the survival of English cathedrals. And one of the things that is most special about English cathedrals is the way in which people worship in them. Now, this is both in the 1630s a cause of rejoicing and a cause of scandal. The National Church, or one of the National Churches, St Paul's, uh, is uh, in ruins. The project of the restoration of cathedrals, the project of the restoration of church buildings, is something of a national scandal in the church and something which everybody, again, is committed to. And what form should that take? Well, this is a book which is published slightly after these events, published in um, the mid-1650s. It's the greatest work of Anglican uh, critical scholarship of the 17th century, the London Polyglot Bible. But it has something to say directly to our context and to what people are trying to achieve in that context. It's edited by this man, Brian Walton, who was trained at Peterhouse in the 1630s and ejected from his livings in 1641 because he annoyed his parishioners so much by demanding that they pay their tithes. Lord is in some senses, I'm sorry, Walton is in some senses an archetypal Lordian or Cousinian cleric, but in other senses um, he's many other things. Um, he is certainly uh, one of the most learned clerics produced from uh, 1630s Cambridge. He is uh, able to hold his head up high in a European world of learning um, marked by knowledge of a wide variety of ancient languages and acquaintance with the latest texts collected into new libraries that are storehouses for a reformation, an ongoing reformation of learning in both the Catholic and the Protestant world, collecting that Lord and indeed Abbott were very keen to sponsor. His vision of what the church should be is a vision which uh, here in uh, the engraved frontispiece, of, uh, engraved by the architect John Webb, um, notable both of them as an early sinologist um, and as a, a great proponent of uh, the extent to which uh, the architecture of the Temple of Solomon should inform the future building of English churches. Um, and uh, the idea of uh, the, w of investigating historically what the Temple of Solomon might have looked like, of restoring the worship of that temple and the structure of its Holy of Holies here with the cherubim, uh, is uh, fundamental to the scholarship attached to the polyglot Bible produced by Walton. It's fundamental also to the activities of church builders like uh, Wren and Cousin. And this is where the special nature of English cathedrals trumps the special nature of the Anglo-Saxon church. Because the English cathedral worship, and in particular the sung worship of the English cathedral, marks the continuity of the tradition of the Temple of Solomon in the modern world. So that what one is restoring in the 1630s is not just a special nationalistic English church. It's a uniquely universal church which avoids the problems of Rome, but which brings to life the history of the Christian church and the history of divine providence uh, as it is enacted through 
uh, the regular repetition of worship across the entirety of the uh, known of known human history uh, and across um, the entirety, therefore, of providential history, from Adam through the Temple of Solomon to the restored temples of the English uh, Church, as it reaches out to restore a universal church. And that's really the background that I think is helping to uh, operate the works of this man, John Cousin, who one can see with his building projects at Peterhouse um, behind him in this portrait. Um, one of the most important of those building projects, not mentioned so far, but entirely contemporary with the restoration of the chapel, was the building project of creating this library, the Pern Library, which is begun in the mid-1630s and which, for various reasons, work carries on for 20 years. But work carries on using the same craftsmen, the craftsmen commissioned by Cousin, who are already at work on the chapel, in particular William Ashley. And Cousin's activities uh, throughout in the 1630s draw together the uh, administration of the rebuilding of the chapel, the acquisition of books for that chapel, and the, rebuild, the restructuring of the Peterhouse Library. On the left-hand side, uh, a catalogue that Cousin had prepared of the library in the 1630s. They draw on networks uh, which go back to the networks established by Andrews through his patronage at Pembroke, not only the involvement of Richard Crashall, but also donors uh, like Richard Drake, the notorious Laudian rector of Radwinter, again um, a victim of um, the iconoclasm of, the six, early, of, of 1641 uh, and ejected uh, by his parishioners. Uh, these are Drake's donations of books to Pembroke, and here is one of Do Drake's donations of books to Peterhouse. I don't need, perhaps, to tell, point out to you that it is, of course, a work in Latin. It is a work about um, the... Um, well, it's a commentary on the ideas of, a, of a, um, one of the Latin, uh, one of, one of the um, doctors of the Catholic Church, scholastic doctors of the Church, a very famous one, and it is printed by a press in the university town of Douai, which is the location of one of the uh, one of the schools designed to teach uh, English recusants. Um, how to become learned. So it is again tying together these worlds. And cousin is also, and here is a, this is evidence of a payment to Ashley, whose name is there, for building in the library from the 1630s. Ashley conducted a campaign every year um, because the college was too poor to pay him to do more, uh, partly because it was building the chapel, but later because of the civil war and the sale of the college's plate to help the king, various other things. Um, and this is an example of Ashley's craftsmanship in um, the library, in a new set of photographs taken by Sarah Rawlinson, which I, I recommend you go and look at. They're on display in Michael House at the moment. Um, and uh, you can see some of the quality of Ashley's work uh, here. Not just Ashley, but as we've seen also uh, Crashaw uh, and the purchase of books, books that fill libraries and books that fill um, churches. Here is Cousin uh, paying for the uh, for boxes to be built by Mr. Ashley to hold books in the chapel. What sort of books are those? We'll come back in a minute. And here is Crashall being paid to buy images, as we've seen, uh, from the London stationer Robert Peake. The most famous images that Robert Peake so sold were these ones by the uh, Flemish artist um, Bootsius of Bolsworth, and they were... Uh, raised at Lord's trial as examples of popish pictures incorporated into the English church. Here you can see them, the Virgin and the Evangelists, illustrating the English Bible um, in widely circulated uh, Flemish engravings. This is a much broader phenomenon than 
um, just pattern books for uh, architects. It's a phenomenon also about the transformation of how people engage with the texts of the Reformation. What is going on then in creating a uh, new textual authority for the worship of the chapel? Um, this is a payment to um, the Cambridge University printers, Thomas Buck and uh, Roger Daniel, for um, printing prayer books. We've seen the absence of prayer books in the Peterhouse Chapel of Matthew Wren, prayer books in Latin. What are the prayer books in Latin going to look like in the Peterhouse Chapel of John Cousin? That payment uh, was probably made in 1638, and its fruits can be seen in composite books. Um, this is the Gibbs Manuscript 12 at Christ Church, and as you can see, it's bound in the same manner with Peterhouse Crest as the part books that we saw earlier. Um, it contains the Book of Common Prayer, printed in 1634, um, but this is a better view of what it contains. Opening, uh, this is the Peterhouse, the copy that survives in Peterhouse. Opening with a, an engraved title page, but with the title missing. The engraving is from uh, an English Bible printed in 1639, which gives you, again, a date together with the payment for when these books were put together. Uh, the fulfilment of the vision of Latin worship in the Chapel of Peterhouse is something which is happening only at the end of the 1630s. The English Book of Common Prayer, and then the books that Buck and Daniel printed specially for the college on uh, the university presses. Uh, the, uh, a, a, a new Latin version of elements of the Book of Common Prayer. And just in case you don't believe me that it's printed by, um, in Cambridge, have a look at that um, woodcut, and you can see that it's uh, a, um, a decorated initial, as indeed are all of these, which occur regularly in uh, the publications of Thomas Buck. Uh, in this case, an English metrical psalter. And then the rest of that book is uh, the, the unique elements of, that are beyond the printing of either the King's Printers in London or the King's Print or um, the University Printer in Cambridge is the, the preparation of music to accompany the service, which is supplied in manuscript left-hand side from the Peterhouse copy, the right-hand side from Gibbs Manuscript 12, in Christ, now in Christchurch. The music for the Latin service is composed only by people known to Cousin. It's composed, the, 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 the texts which are in here that are set to music are set to music by Lusmore, by Henry Moll, who's a king's man who is associated with the establishment of the Peterhouse uh, choir, and by William Child, who, as we know, is put into in contact with Cousin uh, from uh, Windsor, uh, possibly by Wren. So there's a very local context as well as a much broader vision going on here. What other books go into the box that William Ashley has made or stand on the <coughs> altar or are elsewhere to be found in the chapel? Well, I'd like to propose this one, um, a 1634 uh, Bible um, owned undoubtedly by John Cousin um, and, as we'll see, a uh, victim of iconoclasm. And this again provides some of the settings uh, for uh, the history of the Peterhouse Chapel. Other books as well, 40, uh, a lot of money is spent on Liber Precum, much more money than is paid to Buck and Daniel. What is that money spent on? Another specific publishing project. Books of Common Prayer, printed in 1639, all of them bound up with um, an edition of the Latin Psalter, uh, printed by Robert Young, 
uh, also the printer of the Scottish Book of Common Prayer, which uh, helped to provoke the Bishops' Wars, and which are already raging, indeed already coming to their conclusion, a disastrous conclusion for the Crown in 16. 39.40, when Cousin pays just, just short of £30 to have this Latin edition of the Psalter made for Peterhouse. In the middle, you can see an example with annotations of this form, which are found in um, two-thirds of the copies surviving at Peterhouse, none of which were in the library before 1660, but all of which come into the library in the late 17th or early 18th centuries. Um, and which are bound in this form, um, and also found in a large number of, large percentage of the 17 surviving copies worldwide, but not in all of them. So the college evidently prepared some of this edition for use directly in its chapel, setting out which services particular Latin psalms might be sung at. But it also um, particularly after the failure of the chapel, the edition, much of the edition had not been prepared for use and was dispersed and sa for sale. And as you can see, other owners um, have been very interested in the translation of the Psalter used and in the errors in that translation and the problems of the edition. This is a new venture. It is not, as some commentators have suggested, a clandestine text imported from Catholic Europe. It is a new venture in English printing paid for by John Cousin to accompany a new venture on the very eve of the Civil War, still not complete, to create a new form, a revived form of Latin worship in the proper style of the uh, church at Peterhouse. Um, using uh, a range of models and a range of uh, new tools. Uh, these again are some of the songbooks that are being put together and here uh, we have this Bible again because it all comes to an end as we know with the iconoclasm of 1641 and then particularly the iconoclasm of 1643. Um, this Bible was probably bound, as some other books that Cousin valued, including several books, actually, of continental Catholic piety, um, at Little Gidding um, by uh, the community set up there um, by the Farrers, who were enthusiastic purchases of those prints uh, produced by Robert Peake that I showed you earlier. Um, I say that because of this, what is called Chinese box style of um, binding, which is pretty much unique to Little Gidding. But each of them, there are three, has, as you can see and saw in the earlier slide, this central motif, which is this. The sunburst um, surrounding the name of Christ as saviour, uh, which um, cousin incorporated into the title page of his collection of private devotions, first published in 1627, and that attracted immediate opprobrium because that sunburst, a sunburst of course that we'll also see on the roof of the Peterhouse Chapel, contained not only the name of Christ, but the emblem of the Order of the Society of Jesus. For many, this was a sign not of piety, but of impiety, a sign not of renewal and restoration and reinvigoration of an English church that would reach out to reform the world, but of capitulation and treachery and crypto-Catholicism. And so it come, came to an end, as we know. It came to an end in the 1640s with the taking down of um, the attributes of the college chapel, most of which were immediately hidden in the nearest convenient workshop, that is William Ashley's workshop in the Pern Library. They simply crossed a few yards of open ground and were stored there when they became a problem for Cousin's successor as Master Lazarus Seaman, a problem that he forgot about until things were settled at the end of the 1640s and beginning of the 1650s, when he had a sale to deal with 
the remaining accoutrements of the Peterhouse Chapel and of the organ that he had acquired and that had been hidden away. But he acquired some other things as well in 1643-44. He acquired, for example, this book, the first folio of Shakespeare, which um, sadly we no longer have, and this book, which we do have, um, what might well at the time have been thought to be the first printing of the Bible, indeed the first printed book, um, a Vulgate Bible printed at Mainz, in fact, in 1462, not by, not in fact, the Gutenberg Bible, but in fact the um, fourth edition of the Latin Vulgate. Um, so he acquired some great new books for the college's library. He acquired them from John Cousin. They also moved barely uh, any distance. They moved from the Master's Lodge across the hall into the new library that William Ashley was building, a library that suddenly became full because of the confiscation of the wide-ranging international library that John Cousin had built and that he left behind when he went into exile. And the man who put that together, uh, the man superintending this, was a man in many ways quite different from Cousin and Wren, but in some ways quite similar, Lazarus Seaman. Seaman was a London divine who was closely associated with the Westminster of divine, Assembly of Divines, that is, with the Puritan Reformation of the English Church after the Civil War. But he was also a scholar, closely associated with the building of a new library for the cl London clergy at Zion College, the first English book collector whose uh, library was, was sold at auction after his death in the mid-1670s, a man who, like Cousin, presides over the recataloguing and reorganisation of, of, of the Peterhouse Library. A man who oversees the completion of Cousin, the, the careful completion of Cousin's project uh, using Ash, William Ashley to, um, uh, re, to furnish a new centre of learning in the college through the library. Um, this is the final part, the final uh, part of Ashley's building, completed in the mid-1650s, um, the entrance to the library and the frieze above that entrance, College Crest. And a man who was at least as interested in the wide-ranging collecting of books as Lord and Cousin had been. A man who got the London Stationers' Company to give books to the college that were of special interest to the building of its collections, the first Chinese book in Cambridge, an almanac from the 1620s, given by Luke Fawn to the master of Peterhouse in 1645. A 12th century uh, book of homilies, one of the oldest manuscripts in the college's collection, pillaged from um, a, a German monastic library, probably by Swedish troops, bought by the agents of William Lord, and with, when put on uh, the market with Lord's books, acquired by John, the stationer John Rothwell and given to Peterhouse. Um, and other books of divinity, a rather different kind of divinity, from Richard Drake's divinity, again presented to the college library. So Seaman, at least as much as Cousin, is a builder of institutions to associate with a reformation of the university. He may differ with, from Cousin about the form of the church that should accompany that, but he doesn't differ about some of these long-term aims of renewal um, that accompany such building work. So I've told you a story which is about outreach uh, and about the broad range and vision of a group of English churchmen. I've told you a story which is about bringing those churchmen together, as well as seeing how they were split up by events of renewed events of political disaster in England. I've also told you a story about um, the reconstruction, the ideological reconstruction of buildings and the ideological commissioning of works, of printed, of printed works that go with those buildings. And that's an ongoing story uh, for um, the college today. But I hope if we're going, I want to leave you with a controversial thought, I hope if we're going to restore the chapel, we'll think about the role of books in the creation of the chapel, and we'll think about the commissioning 
of special editions of works to be used in the chapel. Uh, here are three great 20th century uh, it's specially commissioned editions of works of the kind that chapels need. Um, D.B. Updike's edition of the Book of Common Prayer, uh, Bruce Rogers' edition of the Holy Bible, and uh, Eric Gill for, uh, um, um, again, the Gospels, Eric Gill for the Golden Cockerel Press. There is no reason why we should limit the college's patronage of the restoration of the chapel to buildings. The people who created the chapel in the 17th century saw books as being part of that world as well. And I hope we might do that too now. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've taken too long. No, no. Um, are there any burning questions for Scott on this, after this most interesting talk? Yes, wait a minute. Let me just bring you the, the mic. Eight books, as you know, are listed in the Compotus Roll for that year. And um, I'm now not at all sure which edition that would be if it's not some sort of uh, version of the 1560 Latin prayer book. What options have we? Um, as I suggested, I thought that the only real option that we have is the 1615 prayer book, which is printed in Oxford, but is specifically aimed at the Society of Christ Church. There are no other um, uh, Latin books of common prayer which are likely to have been available in any number. Now, of course, the amount of money spent and the number of books uh, bought could mean any second-hand purchase. So in that sense, it could have been um, a later edition. There are some from the 1590s of the 1560 prayer book. But um, uh, there isn't a ready-made uh, prayer book which would be suitable, gen suitable for general use in Latin, which is one of the reasons why um, Cousin makes his own. Was there another question? I was interested to hear that uh, it was Lazarus Seaman who hid Cousin's books uh, in the library. Uh, I wanted to, to un unpack a bit, just to make sure I've understood properly. Um, was it also Seaman who hid the textiles from the chapel as part of the same hidden cache. And w whether it was or not, it still seems a very interesting thing for someone of his type of churchmanship to have done. Um, Seaman doesn't hide Cousin's books. He, he, uh, he arranges for their appropriation to the college. They were going to be sold because Cousin was an enemy of the people. And, um, but Seaman uh, gets an order from par the, the relevant parliamentary committee to vest them in the college instead. So it is, it is his action that does this. Um, and um, from that, that is one of the, the, the great acts of magisterial prompt action, uh, possibly in fact the greatest, um, worked by any master of this college because he does it almost immediately on being appointed. Um, and, um, but, but in terms of who is responsible for hiding things, um, I don't know. Um, Seaman knows about these 
the things that are hidden. Um, the likeliest person, if I had to pick somebody um, who is involved right the way through and who knows where all the bodies are buried, um, is a Silesian fellow of the college, German fellow of the college, called John, well, in Latin anyway, called um, Johannes Francius, um, John Frank, um, who uh, was Bursa at the beginning of the 1640s and is the almost, almost the only fellow of the college to survive all the political changes of the 1640s and 50s, and whose hand appears in um, a number of the registers of, um, or whose witness appears in a number of the registers um, of the hidden uh, materials that uh, are made in the course of the 1640s and early 1650s. So, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, Seaman knows about it at some level, to what extent he's responsible. The, the, the only true continuity um, would be provided by Francius, who is also in a position, uh, at least for some of the time, uh, either as Bursa or indeed as the, old, the senior fellow, the only surviving fellow, effectively, um, to oversee some of this. Well, I mean, I think, as, as John said yesterday, um, the, the college is reasonably prompt at responding to, the, to, to some of the changes in political fortune. And by doing uh, do-it-yourself iconoclasm is a much safer form of iconoclasm than um, ask, asking the soldiers and the horses to come round and do it for you. Um, I mean, Dowsing was not here for very long, um, and of course he went immediately over the road to Pembroke again, thinking about um, the, the sort of targets and the linkages that I was trying to build. Um, what motivated people was, um, was actually a, an entirely different vision of Old Testament worship. The vision I've told you about is a vision of the worship of the temple. But of course, there is uh, running throughout the Old Testament a very, very strong uh, narrative and throughout the theology of Israel, a very, very strong narrative um, that what is special about the true form of God is that it, there is no image of him. And um, for um, some sorts of English Christian of the um, 16th and indeed the 17th century, um, the creation of images uh, was a threat to true forms of worship. It was also a form of crypto popery, which again was a threat to, to true forms of worship. Um, and that, I mean, those, those people take different positions on what is acceptable as an image and what is not. And one can see that in the reaction to Cousin's use of the the sunburst and the name of Christ, or the Jesuit logo, if you prefer, um, in his publications. One can see, I mean, you can see people, one group of people trying to um, re-embrace uh, a form of visual expression in the church that goes along with other forms of expression that they want to achieve, and other people reacting very harshly against that. And those are often people, uh, again, this, this can happen at the level, and does happen in the 1620s and 30s, at the level of the congregation. It doesn't necessarily, it, it can happen as in sort of a, the, the classic story of reactions to Laudian priests like Brian Walton, it can happen between the, the avant-garde clergyman and his congregation, but it can also happen within the vestry or within the congregation, within people who are themselves trying to uh, lay participants in the church who are themselves trying to build a new church who can fall out over do we build a new window, do we build a new altar, do, how do we structure um, the shapes and forms and visual exp uh, expression of our church. So these are, these are divisions which actually are, um, are not straightforwardly political and not straightforwardly um, 
uh, don't straightforwardly represent a church party either, though, of course, political events of the 1640s make them so. Um, but they can be divisions between neighbours. Th thinking about that um, uh, <coughs> subtle shift between two, two apparently uh, divided forms, I just wondered, you put up John Cousins' private devotions. Mm. Um, and I was, uh, that's an interesting book to me because it's, some of those private devotions are drawn from the texts of verse anthems. Yes. So there's this sense in which the public and the private are not as simply divided either. And I wondered if um, that had implications for the use of the chapel. Is there any suggestion that, um, as well as being a sort of public building for the members of the college, is it treated as a sort of private chapel for the master as well? You know, it's connected to the master's lodge. It's got, is it ever used in that sense as a private personal space of worship? Well, that, that's, a very, that's a very nice question. Um, um, I mean, I should also say that, that there's an influence of Andrews on Cousins' private devotions as a book as well. Um, the college, I mean, although the library that Seaman gets these books for is referred to as the public library of the college in the act bringing the books there, the college is not a public space. Um, the university is not a public space. This is why there is a problem between town and gown in both Oxford and Cambridge. There are divisions between, marked out ideally by language, by dress, by authority and policing between the university and, in our sense of public space, public space. The library is public in the sense that it's open to the people who have qualifications to read it, that is the fellows of the college who are able also to take books out of it and use them in teaching. There's a sense in which that's the way in which the chapel is public as well. It is the pub a public space for um, members of the college. But I think you're right that it probably does have in that sense, in our sense, therefore a private aspect and is in some ways a, a private place of worship for to some extent, the master, but certainly the master and fellows. Um, and of course, John's arguments, which um, are uh, um, the, the very clear case that John made, and which is, it seems to me from the evidence to be incontrovertible for the uh, influence of Andrews's private chapel on the design of um, buildings like the Peterhouse Chapel, and in particular the Peterhouse Chapel, again, uh, draws um, no, highlights that that sense that um, this is a space for, uh, in some senses, for an individual and their retinue, the master and fellows, as much as uh, for um, ordinary people. In that sense, it isn't, it isn't a parish church. Um, though, again, no, one ought to be careful about thinking about parishes as wholly open communities. Um, that it's not the, 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 the sort of sense of public that we would want to give to the word is, is not really meaningful to a contemporary um, uh, audience. 